Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Like many men of color, the man pictured here, Joseph Thomas Wilson, understood that the institution of slavery would fall as a result of the Civil War and that the underlying racism would linger far longer, probably beyond their lifetimes. Wilson was born and raised free in Norfolk, Virginia, and reportedly left home at about age 16 for New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he received an education and went to work on a whaling ship and the railroads. In 1862, he goes to New Orleans after the city falls to Union forces and gets involved directly in the war in the military when he joins the second Louisiana Native Guards. He doesn't stay long. He's discharged for sickness. But he then returns to the Army with the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. He goes on to suffer a severe wound in the bowels at the February 1864 Battle of Alusty and is discharged in May of 1864, never to return to the military. He is best known for a post-war book that he wrote. It was published in 1888 and it's called The Black Phalanx, which is a reference to the powerful military formation of the ancient Greek armies. Wilson's book is a masterpiece of American military history, tracing the volunteerism and the actions of black men who served in the army from the revolution up through the Civil War. Also in the book, and what I want to read to you now, is an excerpt where Wilson describes racism. He talks about the way white European immigrants treated enslaved people and Native Americans differently, and he observes that the what he calls the American Negro is a race separate from Africans. Before I read the excerpt, know that he's going to mention some names that may be familiar to you students of the Civil War. John Brown of Harper's Ferry, abolitionists Wendell Phillips and Charles Sumner, and newspaper editor Horace Greeley. So here's what Wilson had to say. It's called, subtitled, Public Opinion. It seems proper, Wilson says, before attempting to record the achievements of the Negro soldiers in the War of the Rebellion, that we should consider the state of public opinion regarding the Negroes at the outbreak of the war. Also, in connection herewith, to note the rapid change that took place during the early part of the struggle. For some cause, unexplained in a general sense, the white people in the colonies and in the states came to entertain against the colored races therein a prejudice that showed itself in a hostility to the latter's enjoying equal civil and political rights with themselves. Various reasons are alleged for it, but the difficulty of really solving the problem lies in the fact that the early settlers in this country came without prejudice, without prejudice against color. The Negro, Egyptian, Arab, and other colored races known to them lived in European countries where no prejudice on account of color existed. How very strange then that a feeling antagonistic to the Negroes should become a prominent feature in the character of the European immigrants to these shores and their descendants. It has been held by some writers that the American prejudice against the Negroes was occasioned by their docility and unresenting spirit. Surely no one acquainted with the Indian, the Native American, will agree that he is docile or a wanting in spirit, yet occasionally there is manifested a prejudice against him. The recruiting officers in Massachusetts refused to enlist Indians as well as Negroes in regiments and companies made up of white citizens, though members of both races could sometimes be found in white regiments. 
During the rebellion of 1861 to 65, some Western regiments had one or two Negroes and Indians in them, but there was no general enlistment of either race in white regiments. The objection was on account of color, or as some writers claim, by the fact of the races, Negro and Indian having been enslaved, be the cause what it may, a prejudice, strong, unrelenting, barred the two races from enjoying with the white race, equal civil and political rights in the United States. So very strong had that prejudice grown since the revolution, enhanced it may be by slavery and docility, that when the rebellion of 1861 burst forth, a feeling stronger than law, like a Chinese wall, only more impregnable, encircled the Negro and formed a barrier betwixt him and the army. Doubtless peace, a long peace, lent its aid materially to this state of affairs. Wealth, chiefly, was the dream of the American from 1815 to 1860, nearly half a century, a period in which the Negro was friendless, save in a few strong-minded, iron-hearted men like John Brown in Kansas, Wendell Phillips in New England, Charles Sumner in the United States Senate, Horace Greeley in New York, and a few others, who dared, in the face of strong public sentiment, to plead his cause, even from a humane platform. In many places, he could not ride in a streetcar that was not inscribed, colored persons ride in this car. The deck of a steamboat, the boxcars of the railroad, the pit of the theater, and the gallery of the church were the locations accorded him. The church lent its influence to the rancor and bitterness of a prejudice as deadly as the sap of the upas. That's a poisonous sap, by the way, of a tree. The Negro, Wilson continues, had no remembrance of the country of ancestry, Africa, and he abjured their religion. In the South, he had no family. Women were merely the temporary sharer of his pleasures. His master's cabins were the homes of his children during their childhood. While the Indian perished in the struggle for preservation of his home, his hunting grounds, and his freedom, the Negro entered into slavery as soon as he was born. In fact, was often purchased in the womb and was born to know first that he was a slave. If one became free, he found freedom harder to bear than slavery. Half civilized, deprived of nearly all rights, in contact with the superiors in wealth and knowledge, exposed to the rigor of a tyrannical prejudice molded into laws, he contented himself to be allowed to live. The Negro race, however, it must be remembered, is the only race that has ever come in contact with the European race and been able to withstand its atrocities and oppression. All others, like the Indian, whom they could not make subservient to their use, they have destroyed. The Negro race, like the Israelites, multiplied so rapidly in bondage that the oppressor became alarmed and began discussing methods of safety to himself. The only people able to cope with the Anglo-American or Saxon with any show of success must be of patient fortitude, progressive intelligence, brave in resentment, and earnest in endeavor. In spite of his surroundings and state of public opinion, the African lived and gave birth largely through amalgamation with the representatives of the different races that inhabited the United States to a new race, the American Negro. So there you have the description of Joseph Wilson, formerly of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, in his book, the Black Phalanx. And thanks for listening. See you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.